Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that gracious introduction. Thank you for all being here. You honor me uh, by even bothering to hear what I might have to say. Um, I need to say up front, it's a little intimidating to think about the fact that I'm supposed to, in some way, share with you some nugget of wisdom that you don't already know. And in fact, most of you, I'm pretty sure, know most of these nuggets of wisdom. But I'm so grateful you could come to my last lecture. I have some of my students here who I think are hoping this is in fact <laughs> my last lecture. <laughs> so the last lecture series, I think most of us, many of us think about that as uh, dating back to Randy Pausch who gave this emotional last lecture in 2007. But I did a little bit of research and I discovered it goes back farther than that at many institutions. I saw a description of a last lecture which says that we invite a lecture, we invite a faculty member to come and talk about his research. Think about that for a second. <laughs> you may laugh if you'd like, okay. Or his philosophy of life. Those are heavy thoughts, okay. What I like to hear was, what would be the things that you would want to share with your students, and I think hopefully my co some of my colleagues as well, if this were the last chance you had to talk to them. And trust me, I have a lot of things to say. <laughs> a lot of things to say. Uh, some years ago, one of my trusted colleagues told me Never lecture if the students can read the material. There's an important lesson. When I first got to Otterbein, I learned a lesson that I'd better show up to class early because one day I walked into my class and there was no one there. And there was a note on the blackboard saying, class dismissed. <laughs> I'd forgotten that story, but Maggie reminded me about that story. <laughs> I learned you always need to be aware of your environment, so I'm trying to be careful about not walking into this step here. Some years later, when I was teaching a class in Towers Hall, back in the days when we had hanging monitors that hung from the ceiling, okay, I learned if you walk into one of those things, they don't move. And you give your students something they can talk about for years. <laughs> but you really don't want to know what I might tell you that's important. Instead, I want to, the inspiration for this lecture came from Katie, who is here, and Olivia, who are here. They were students in my leadership class this fall. And one of the things I typically ask my classes to do at the end of the semester as part of their final exam is to write about what have you learned in this class? It's a great question, okay? I think in 35 years, Katie is the first person to raise her hand and say, so I have a question. What did you learn from us? And of course, I hadn't studied. <laughs> So I had no idea what I'd learned, and I think I faked some kind of an answer. <laughs> but I've thought about that question since then, and as I was thinking about um, this last lecture, I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if I talked about what I've learned from my students? And then I realized, well, I haven't just learned from my students. I've also learned from my colleagues, and I've learned from my family, and I've learned from other people as well. <laughs> That's a bit of an unwieldy title. I have a second title that I will share with you at the end of my presentation, but I didn't want to put that up because that gives away everything I'm going to tell you. So let's go back to what I learned after college. 
I graduated from college in 1972. <laughs> it's hard to believe that guy has anything to learn, isn't it? Okay. I'll, that's actually one of my better pictures. Okay. Okay. I particularly like this one over here with the purple shirt and the white and purple tie because I went to a purple and white institution. So surprisingly enough, I did learn some things after college and I'd like to share those with you by telling you some stories about some of the people I've met and some of the lessons I've learned from them. First, before we go any farther, I know there are a number of distinguished guests in this room, but I know a number of you are asking, who is the very attractive woman sitting here in the second row? And so I'd like for you to all, who, if you haven't met her already, to meet my wife, Mrs. Ledlam. You want to stand up? Many of my students have heard stories about Mrs. Ledlam, and I would appreciate it if you didn't share those with her. <laughs> you may not, you probably don't know this. I got married very late in life. I met Cindy in my 40s. We got married three days after my, or four days, three days after my uh, 49th birthday. So one of the things I learned from Cindy was sometimes you just have to wait for the perfect person. So if you're, if you're not in a relationship now and you're worried about that, just know sometimes you just have to wait for the perfect person. Okay? Another lesson I learned is your wife is always right. Okay. So ha, I see people's spouses <laughs> nodding and touching them and going, yeah, remember that, don't forget that. Okay. All right. John, you knew that already, didn't you? Yeah. Because this is John Reynolds, Chris Reynolds' husband over here. And John, it's not just that your wife is always right. Chris is always right. <laughs> okay, so, graduated from college. I actually had some things to learn in, from 1976 to 1978. I taught at Ohio University and I had the pleasure of coaching individual events at Ohio University. And I want to share with you. That's the individual events team at Ohio University in 1978. You're wondering where is Dr. Ludlam in this picture or is he? Have you already seen him? Okay. All right. There's a theme that will emerge here at some point. So that, this is me. And Despite the fact that Jeff has on a white suit and I do not, I did at that time, in fact, own a white John Travolta <laughs> three-piece suit, okay? And if you look very carefully, whoops, oops, you'll notice this guy here in the cowboy hat. You can ask, does he happen to look familiar? Does he happen to look like somebody who Dr. Ludlam just introduced us to? So, yes. So I don't want to talk about those two guys. Well, I do, but we're not going to talk about them tonight. I want to talk about this young lady here, Nancy. Nancy was a student of mine at Ohio University from 1976 to 1978. Some of you have heard this story before. In 1978, Nancy came to me and said, um, I have decided that I'm going to move to L.A. and I'm going to do voice work, and I'm going to study with a man, an older man in L.A. who I've met who's promised to be my mentor, okay? And just so you know, I've been doing voice work for a couple of years in Dayton on a part-time basis. Well, my reaction was, you're going to what? <laughs> now, I was leaving OU, so I didn't have any self-interest. You're going to fly across the country, and you're going to go study with an older guy out there? No, I think, I think actually if you're smart, 
because here's what I know. I know a lot. At that point, I was 28 years old. I had all the wisdom of the world. Don't go to L.A. That's a very competitive market. Stay in Dayton. Build your skills. And then someday you can move to maybe Columbus and then Cleveland and then L.A. Okay? Besides, there's this older guy who's going to be your mentor, and that kind of creeps me out a little bit. Okay? All right? So some of you know there's a sad ending to this story in terms of my own self-esteem. <laughs> Nancy went to L.A. Today, she has a successful career in animation voicing and has also done movies and TV shows. And she is, in fact, the voice of Bart Simpson. So there are a couple of important lessons here. <laughs> One is, don't take my advice. Okay? Although I grew out of that advice, and now I tell students, and I really want to emphasize to you, you need to pursue your dreams with passion. And I say that because two weeks ago in one of my classes, we, we talked a little bit about career interests, and my students repeatedly said to me, well, what I'd really like to do is, but maybe I don't, can't, don't actually have the ability to do that. Don't worry, Carly, it wasn't in your class. <laughs> Carly's looking at me going, I don't remember that conversation. It was in a different class. Al may remember part of that conversation. So I want to say to students, if you have a dream, pursue it. And that's a wonderful moral to the Nancy Cartwright story. Except the Nancy Cartwright story, I only told you part of the story. I told you she'd been working for two years in Dayton doing voiceover work, including voices for different characters. So she'd developed some skills already, and she had some talents. I didn't tell you that sometime during that time, a representative from Warner's Brother was in the Dayton area, heard those ads, met Nancy, and said to Nancy, I think you've really got talent in this area. You might want to explore it. Here are a list of contacts I have. I told you she went to L.A. I didn't tell you that she didn't, didn't just go to L.A. and wait table. She transferred to UCLA and got a degree in theater, which helped her get jobs in television and movies. And I told you she studied with this older guy. His name was Dawes Butler. And I found out later on he was the voice of three of my favorite cartoon characters, Huckleberry Hound, <laughs> Snagglepuss, and one of my all-time favorites, Yogi Bear. Okay. I didn't tell you that while Nancy was in L.A. going to UCLA, every Saturday morning she would hop on the bus and take the bus 20 to 30 minutes to the Butler house where she would have a lesson with Dawes and often spend the rest of the day with his family. He had three or four boys, no daughter. He and his wife sort of adopted Nancy as their daughter. And some of you know the story about when Nancy went to audition for the part in what became The Simpsons. Okay? At that time, she was auditioning for a part in an animated short that would be shown occasionally during the Tracy Ullman show. And the character, the director, the creator, that's the word I was looking for, of that short series asked her in to interview, because she'd been doing a lot of uh, cartoon voices by that time, asked her in to audition for the part of Lisa. You know this story? So she walked in the room. She had seen the script, and she said, I think I have the boy's voice down better than the girl's voice. I recently saw an interview with her and she said, now come on, be real. If you knew about that show, who would you want to do, Lisa or Bart? Okay. So what I want to suggest to you is there are other lessons, yes, 
Pursue your dreams with a passion, but know your options. So I'm always preaching to my students, you may think this is what you want to do. Think about other options you might have. Okay? Know your strengths. So we use strengths finder a lot around here. A whole lot of other people can tell you about your strengths. Your friends, your neighbors, your supervisors can tell you about your strengths. Have a plan and a backup plan. Okay? Find a mentor or mentors or build a network. We preach that a lot. And work, 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 work. Okay? But pursue your passions. I want to tell you about another one of my students. This is Garth Walker. I don't know how many of you know Garth Walker. Probably a few of you. Okay? Garth Walker is currently the president and general manager and co-owner of Little Turtle Golf Club. That's a great Otterbein success story. Okay. What I think is, makes the story even more interesting is that when Garth was in high school, he mowed grass at Little Turtle Golf Course in order to build up money so he could afford to go to college. And then all the way through college, he continued to mow grass at the golf course. The other thing that's important about Garth is he didn't come to Otterbein thinking he wanted to own a golf course. He came to Otterbein first to study broadcasting because of the legendary Dr. Griss who had preceded me and he knew Dr. Griss. And then after he'd been at Otterbein for a while, he decided, well, he'd studied journalism and business and public relations. And I'm not sure what he graduated in. His resume says uh, journalism and business. I think, in fact, it was public relations. But he took a series of those different kinds of courses. And when he graduated from college, he didn't go to work for a golf course. He went to work for the public opinion, the community newspaper here in Westerville. And then he was contacted by the owner of Little Turtle. Why would he contact Garth? Garth had been mowing greens and fairways and working, working, working all the time at Little Turtle. And he knew Garth. And he knew Garth had a background in public relations. And he asked Garth if Garth would come work for him in marketing and sales. And so Garth spent some time at Little Turtle selling memberships and creating brochures and doing press releases. And eventually, uh, the owner asked Garth if he would be a manager of the club, and so Garth moved up to become a manager of the club. And then other opportunities arose, and he moved to Florida to manage the golf course down there. And one day he got a call from the owner of the club who said, Garth, I'm getting ready to retire. I'm wondering if you would like to buy part of this club. And you need to know when Garth bought part of the club was in the heart of the recession, so, and one of the things that the recession did was damage private country clubs, yes, okay. One of the first things to go when you're thinking about, well, how can I cut back on my spending? Well, I'm not gonna get rid of the Escalade. Maybe I can give up my club, country club membership, okay? So Garth took a risk to buy the club, and he's now, as I said, the general manager and owner. I talked to him last week. He said, I just need to tell you, and you should tell your students, it's not, the greatest thing in the world, and there are challenges each and every day to running a country club, even in this environment. But Garth adds a sixth part of our pursue your dreams with a passion, and that is that your path will not always be linear. Okay. You, may, you don't know, or you may not know at this point, like Nancy, Nancy knew at 19 years old that she wanted to be a cartoon voice. I did not know at 19 years old that I wanted to be a college professor. Okay. I really didn't know that until I was about 23. Actually, I probably didn't really know that until I was 28. And uh, John Reynolds taught me I wanted to be a college professor. That's a bit of a lie. Okay. All right. So pursue your dreams with a passion. Now, I, there's a second lesson I'd like for us to think about. And I want to start by talking about when I came to Otterbein. Now there's a look for you, okay? 
And I tried like the devil to figure out what made me think that that could possibly be a good look. <laughs> so some of you know who that is. Let me close in a little bit more in case you didn't know who that, that was. The esteemed Dean Gaddy, Vice President for Student Affairs. Okay. Right. You, you, you must have been my inspiration. Okay. Right. So I came to Otterbein in 1980. And shortly after I'd been at Otterbein, I think in actually 1981, I met Jeff Wilson. Now, Jeff Wilson was from a very poor family, uh, worked as at, during high school as an on-air personality overnight on WTVN, worked all the way through Otterbein as an on-air personality at WTVN, came to Otterbein, my assumption would be, well, what's he going to major in? Of course, he's going to major in broadcasting. Ah, but he did not, because Jeff had worked in broadcasting long enough, and he majored in business administration and accounting. He left Otterbein, and he began to slowly work his way up in the radio business as a controller, and then a controller, and then a senior vice president, I'm sorry, then a senior manager in charge of finance for first one chain, and then he worked for a number of years as a station manager for uh, Radio One here in town, which is, as you may know, urban contemporary. Moved to Cleveland, moved to Cincinnati. Today he is, and I need to check my records on this, the senior vice president for Radio One in charge of, great. Okay, so one of the important lessons you also learn is make sure you're organized and you have everything right where you can find it. Here we go. So he is a, a senior regional vice president for Radio One uh, based in Washington, D.C. He is responsible for all daily operations for Radio One properties in Washington and has regional supervisory responsibility over Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Charlotte, Detroit, St. Louis, and Indianapolis. He's also very active in his community. This is a graduate we can be proud of, but this story is not about Jeff. I wrote to Jeff and I said to Jeff, do you mind if I share your story with this audience? And he wrote back to me, Absolutely. I was basically homeless at one point and have worked every day since I was 14 years old for food, clothing, etc. At one point, the only thing we owned was a car that we bought for $150 and the bank took it away. But we got it back. Now, here's the important thing. I got myself through Otterbein by working full time, getting loans and grants, and with the God-given help of Dean Van Sant, who kept her eyes open for such loans and grants. She was an angel to me. Now, any of you who know Dean Van know that that was not unusual for Dean Van to help students find grants from these magical sources and get loans from these magical sources. And the rumor is a lot of those loans were funded by Dean Van, and she just had faith that the students would give that money back. Okay. Now, what I learned from Dean Van is you can make a difference. Dean Van's not the only person I learned that lesson from, but she was probably the first person I learned that lesson from. I vividly remember a phone call I got from her. Um, I want to say probably in the fall of 1981, and I'm pretty sure I had Jeff in a public speaking class and she called up and she said, so John, how is Jeff Wilson doing in your class? I thought, well, that's an extraordinarily inappropriate question for 
a vice president to call me and ask me. And I said, I sort of stumbled. She said, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to know how he's doing in your class academically. I want to know how is he doing? Does he look healthy? Does it look like he's getting enough to eat? Is he getting enough sleep? Okay. That's an, a very unusual thing about Otterbein, and I found it over and over and over here. People care, and people believe they can make a difference. One of the things we do at Otterbein is we read the common book because a graduate of Otterbein cared enough to give us money to have a common book and because faculty members like Dr. Doherty had the energy to get that program alive. Okay? I read a book some years ago which I really, really, really enjoyed and I would recommend to you uh, by Tracy Kidder called Mountains Beyond Mountains and Mountains Beyond, Mountains Beyond Mountains is a story of Paul Farmer who was a, uh, P, had a PhD in social anthropology and a medical degree from Harvard and devoted the early part of his life, not to doing research, to trying to wipe out multiple, multiple antibiotic resistant TB. Because we think TB is dead, but in the, in the Caribbean, TB is very much alive, and what the problem is, is because people have used so many different antibiotics and insecticides on the, the virus, it's become resistant to most of the current treatment. Well, Paul Farmer created treatments, holistic treatments, and was successful in reducing the rate of multiple uh, disease-resistant tuberculosis to a 20% rate, an 80% survival rate, which people thought was absolutely impossible. So, of course, he came back to Harvard where he could have a comfortable appointment. No, of course he didn't. He went to Russia to try to do the same things and to Africa to try to do the same things and has been working since then to reduce the preponderance of AIDS all over the world. He's a MacArthur Fellow, you know that's that genius grant. They got huge grants from the Gates Foundation. It's an inspirational story. But I have to tell you, it's kind of intimidating. And for me, I can say, wow, that's a great story. Isn't he a great man? Well, I can't be by him. I can't be like him. I don't have a PhD and an MD. Okay. I don't have the ability to wipe out illness, so maybe I can't really follow that model. I was a little less intimidated by this book. <laughs> Remember Little Princes? Okay. And Connor Grennan, who came to see us, has a wonderful um, self-effacing style. He writes about meeting those kids and says, I was kind of intimidated, but I know how to deal with people, and after all, kids are just little people. And he talks about himself in a way that says, well, you know, I didn't really have any expertise when I went into that. And some of that's a fib because he had spent significant years in advocacy organizations in Europe. So again, inspirational, made me want to cry, a little intimidating. At Otterbein, there are lots and lots and lots of stories about people who make a difference. Go online, look at the alumni awards, look at the awards for young alumni and the kinds of things those people have done a year or two out of college to raise significant money. Look at our alumni awards. You'll get a chance to meet Dom and Terry Tiberi this spring, uh, who after the tragic death of their daughter decided to do something about distracted driving and are making significant changes in the way the state views distracted driving. I look around this room and I see colleagues who've made a difference. I see Melissa and Leslie who work every day to give students opportunities to develop leadership skills and work to feed the community and house the homeless and get food to the hungry. I see Julie who's spent a lot of time working with various sorts of causes related to safety and wellness and takes the time 
to sponsor Mortarboard and work with those students in addition to that. I see teaching colleagues around the room who I know devote enormous amounts of time to helping to make their students more interested because they believe you can make a difference. And I see students in this class, I see students in here, who made a difference in my classes. I see a couple of students who organized a alcohol-free trip to a football game and students went and students saw another alternative. I learned from Katie and Olivia, I'm going to get back to the question they asked at the very beginning of the course, what did you learn from us? I learned from Katie and Olivia that not only can you make a difference, you will make a difference because attitude is contagious. I didn't tell you this yet. I would come to class some nights and I would be just dog tired. And the students in that class, Katie and Olivia and I think Michael's in the back, were always so enthusiastic about learning. They smiled, they got excited. When students are enthusiastic, we respond to that enthusiasm. Attitude is contagious. Okay? Unfortunately, when students are a little less than enthusiastic, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick. <laughs> I, I'm going to I'm going to pick on Tim because do you, do you, do you know Tim? Okay. Does he have any gear other than sixth? Okay. Could he ever be less than enthusiastic? So I picked on you, and you, he was actually sort of nodding off there for a second. So. so that's my clue that maybe I've spent enough time here. Okay. I, I'm blessed every day by students like Tim and Paul and all the rest of you who came out to see me because you make a difference in my life. Okay, so here's, here's the summation. Uh, no, before we do that, let me talk about this particular quotation. Some years ago, um, I was asked to teach in the senior year experience, and I taught the senior year internship seminar. Uh, and, and my colleague persuaded me that we should read Tuesdays with Maury in that class. Well, I was a little skeptical about Tuesdays with Maury. I'm not sure I thought of Mitch Albom as one of America's great literary forces. <laughs> but Dan was pretty adamant. And Dan said, no, we're going to use this class. We're going to use this book because after all, we are team teaching this class and you cannot make all of the decisions. <laughs> hmm, there's an interesting concept. I can't make all the decisions. Well, that's unfortunate. So we read the class. And what I discovered was my students responded extraordinarily to that book. There's something about that book that resonates with students, senior students who are beginning to make careers. It's a story about Mitch Albom's old college professor, Maury Schwartz. And uh, Mitch is watching the news one night, and there's a feature on Maury Schwartz, his favorite college professor, the guy who mentored him more than almost anybody, who taught him about the world. I think Maury taught sociology. And he found out that Maury, this godhead figure, had contracted ALS and was slowly dying because that's what happens with ALS, okay? And Mitch went to see Maury, and Maury arranged with Mitch that they would meet every Tuesday. What a clever title. Tuesdays with Maury. That they would meet every Tuesday, and Maury would provide lessons for Mitch, okay? Lessons that are about a whole lot more than just how to get a good job. These are lessons about how to live a good life. Okay? And one of the quotations from that book that 
has stuck with me is that the way you get moving into your life is to devote yourself to loving others, devote yourself to your community around you, and devote yourself to creating something that gives you purpose and meaning. I would hope that for you. I would wish that for you. So let's try to summarize, I think now. Yes, now we're going to summarize. Okay. Pursue your dreams, and in pursuing your dreams, know your options, know your strengths, have a plan and a backup plan, find a mentor or mentors, build a network, work, 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 and make sure you understand the path is not always linear. And you can and will with a typographical error in it. My next to last PowerPoint slide it has a typographical error in it. <laughs> and you can and will make a difference. You can try to figure out where the typographical error is anytime you like. Okay. And so in summary, this was going to be the title of my talk. You can do amazing things. And I would hope for you that you would do amazing things. Now I have a, I have a request to make of you. And that request is that you, tonight you do two amazing things that will make a difference in people's lives. Okay? First of all, if your parents are still alive, I want you to call them. Pick up the phone, call them and say, Mom and Dad, I just called to tell you I love you. And you can hang up the phone then. <laughs> all right? They may step all night wondering what's happened. <laughs> oh my God, is he in jail? <gasps> oh, let me call his roommate back and make sure he hasn't jumped off a bridge somewhere. Your parents need to know that. That makes a difference in their life to know that you love them. Okay? Second, I want you to think about people on this campus who've made a difference to you and think about ways in which you could thank them for the ways in which they've made a difference in your life. I would recommend to you a specific tool if this is a favorite college professor, okay? And that's a tool that's available at the Center for Teaching and Learning site and it's called Thank a Prof. And if you go to the CTL site and you look for Thank a Prof, you can then click up and they will let you write a note to your professor telling them how they made a difference for you. Okay? Now, I realize many of the professors in this room get those all the time. I think I've had three of them in the time I've been at Otterbein. <laughs> Wonder why that is, huh, Paul? Paul's like, well, of course. Jeez, who was stupid enough to write you a thank you, prof? No. <laughs> you would be surprised how much difference that makes and how much that reinforces the work that your professors do for you okay now I'm gonna make a proviso I know following this you all want to write me a note and tell me how wonderful this was and how much you owe to me I'm probably popping out the microphone right now how much you owe to me because of something I did for you. Don't write a thank a prof note to me, okay? Give me money. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> okay, well, not that serious. If, if, if that person's not a professor, if by some chance they happen to be somebody who's working in student affairs or uh, the Center for Community Engagement, hypothetically, <laughs> okay, then it's going to be a little harder for you. Okay? You're going to have to get a note. And you're going to have to write them a thank you note. Okay? And if you don't know where to get thank you notes, the bookstore sells them. Okay? In fact, you might go get a package of thank you notes and start thinking about all the people who've made a difference in your life and do something amazing, which is thank them for the difference that they made. Okay? And in that spirit, I want to thank so many of you 
for the difference you've made in my life. I, many of my students are here. I've learned much more from you than the convenient little lessons I could talk about from my LEAD 2000 class. You have taught me enormous amounts of things beyond get to class on time because somebody's going to write a note on the board saying class is dismissed. Okay. And I said that and watch, I'm going to go to class tomorrow night and there's going to be a note on the board that says class is dismissed. I just know that's going to happen. Okay. My colleagues, uh, many of you know, I, well, maybe you know how I feel about you, but you have been an inspiration to me in the way you work with your students and the way you care about students. I have always appreciated the entire Otterbein community because I tell people I came here in 1980. I expected to stay for three years until I finished my PhD dissertation, and I stayed. Now, yeah, it took me a long time to finish that dissertation. <laughs> and by then, I may have been unemployable anywhere else. <laughs> but I stayed because I found a place that cared about me. I should have had to leave in five years because when I came to Otterbein, there were two kinds of faculty members here. There were tenure track faculty, they were actually tenured faculty, and there were faculty who were on what was called fixed term contracts. And the concept of a fixed term contract was you taught for three years or five years, and at the end of that time, you were gone. You couldn't get renewed, you were gone. Okay? Now, that was an important decision for the university in a variety of ways because they were facing serious financial pressure and it was a convenient solution. But midway through my second year at Otterbein, senior faculty said, we got to stop this system. It's a two-class system and we need to let those fixed-term contract people at least apply for a renewed contract. Well, that's going to cost, you know, tenured faculty, that's going to cost you money. Because as the salary of those people increases, there's going to be less money for you. And I remember Dr. Colder standing up in a faculty meeting saying, yes, it's going to cost us money, but it's the right thing to do. And those faculty decided they were going to do something amazing. They were going to try to change the contract system here. So at that time, fixed term contracts gave way to renewable term contracts. And then in the 19, late 1980s, the faculty decided again, well, these, there are too many of these people who are in these fixed term renewable, or I'm sorry, in these renewable term contracts. We need to move more of them into tenure track contracts and give them the opportunity to get tenure. Okay. And the Board of Trustees responded, as I think you would expect the Board of Trustees to respond. Why? This is a system that seems pretty nice for us. Well, we think this is the right thing to do. These people deserve tenure. Argument after argument after argument. I tell you what, we'll make a deal. We will do this if your tenured faculty agree to go through a post-tenure review mm, so that we can weed out all the dead wood. I don't know that that was the bias, but so we can identify those faculty members who are not performing up to, the, up to their best capacity and create contracts for them, developmental contracts, so that they can get better. That's a sacrifice that tenured faculty made at the time for people like me who were on renewable contracts so that I could move into a tenure contract. These are people who said, I want to make a difference. I can do amazing things. So that's one of many reasons I am so grateful I came to Otterbein. I've learned an enormous amount in my 35 years. And I am grateful to all of you, not just for coming and listening to me and putting up with me for 50 minutes, pretty impressive, uh, but for all the things you've done to make my life such a wonderful life over the last 35 years. Thank you.
Yeah. Now you're going to make me cry. Well, I'm going to make you cry. Okay. Thank you all again. I think he definitely deserves another round of applause. Thank you. One dollar? <laughs> Every penny. <laughs>